I'd like to welcome all of you to the studio today for Between the Covers, and that is the new name of the WXEO Book Club, and it is sponsored by WXEO and Murder on the Beach Mystery Bookstore in Delray Beach. And I want to welcome our author who is here today from New York. By the way, anything's better than New York yeah, today, that's right? That's true. So that's you, wouldn't, true. you wouldn't care where we were. That's true. Okay. <laughs> but I wish we were outside. So. Uh, <laughs> this is Alex Berenson. And Alex began his journalism career at the Denver Post. He was one of the first employees of the street.com, and that's the groundbreaking financial news website. Then he went to something you might have heard of called the New York Times in 1999, I believe you, you started there. He covered all kinds of stories from the drug industry to Hurricane Katrina. He served as a correspondent in Iraq, which, interesting. That experience led to his winning the Edgar Award with his debut novel, The Faithful Spy. He left the New York Times as a journalist he returned to the New York Times on the number one bestseller list, so not too bad, uh, as a novelist. His latest novel, which is right here in front of me, is in the John Wells series. It's The Counterfeit Agent. It is my pleasure to welcome Alex Berenson to WXEL. Thank, Thank you, you for being Thank here. Thank you for having me. So, reporting. You miss it at all? Oh, there are things I miss about it. I, I, I miss it less than I thought I did. When I left the Times in 2010, I thought I was gonna do more work, and I actually, for a while, I still had my desk there, and I still had my computer, and f I, I lost my email, then I lost my computer, then I lost my desk, and then, then I really wasn't connected to the paper anymore. Uh, I, I, writing a book a year doesn't give me that much time to be a reporter. I do try to write one or two pieces of nonfiction a year. Alex, I'm gonna ask you just to, to speak up sure. just a little more sure. so so we, we can I, I can see some people may not be able to hear you I would think it would be a lot more fun to make things up than to, to tell the truth so <laughs> there is that element uh, yeah I mean I do enjoy getting to control my characters and be inside their heads and make sure that you know they're doing what I want them to do one of the frustrations of being a reporter is that you never, or not never, but oftentimes you have the feeling people are not telling you the whole story. And as I like to say about my books, my characters, they can lie to each other and they can even lie to themselves, but they can't lie to me. Was it scary for you to leave, um, as my father would, would call, the job where you get paid every week? Uh, yes, it was. Um, the Times, uh, much less so now, but even when I started, it was sort of a, once you got hired, you, you essentially could stay f for your whole career. Uh, it was sort of the, it was not a place that many journalists left. Um, and that's changed a lot in the last few years. I, I think I actually left at a time when its prospects looked the bleakest. Um, and I think it's done a lot better in the last couple of years. Um, uh, it's sort of made the transition to being this powerful, internet site as well as a you know as well as a very good newspaper but when i left although i knew that i was taking a chance i also knew that the paper wasn't as stable as it always had been you left a very i'll call it a vibrant career where where there are people coming in and out of your your day all the t you know 24 hours a day to really a solitary existence. Write, writing can be lonely. Yes, very lonely. Was that a, a challenge yeah, that's for a, you? Yeah, that's a challenge. Um, uh, I need to make sure, you know, I try to make sure I get out of the house once a day <laughs> at least um, because it is, uh, it is easy to, to sort of have the day go by and realize I haven't talked to anybody but the dog. Um, less so now, um, we now have a, uh, an 18 month old and so She's in the house and you know, there's, there's somebody taking care of her. So I'm not gonna be alone all the time, but, but it was, that certainly was true. And it's still, yeah, I still don't have the, as much interaction as I probably should. You are a great researcher. And for anyone who's read any of your books, that is, that's so obvious. Your background as a reporter, I assume, helped yeah, you out on this. Very much, very much. Can you talk about how much time you need to spend on a book to get the research right? Uh, you know, I, 
I, I spend as much time as I need. I, as much, I, do you spend as much time researching as you do writing? In some ways, I, sp I mean, I might spend more, but that isn't necessarily a good thing. Uh, you know, I've, been, I've been talking a lot lately about the internet and how the internet affects me as a writer. And one of the things it does is it makes research very easy on one level, but it also makes it very easy to waste time uh, researching and sort of over-researching. We, we all know that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, it's just everybody does it. And so uh, at some point, I have, to, I have to kind of stop researching and stop reading, you know, whether it's a, the RAND Corporation reports or obscure newspapers or, you know, message boards about X, Y, and Z and just get to writing. Um, uh, you know, I, I also talk to whoever, you know, I can for these books. There are, you know, some people, not necessarily within the United States government, but some within the government, some who are former government officials, uh, you know, and then just other people who will talk to me. So, I, so both internet research and, you know, real in-person research. We're talking about a spy novel, essentially. People are talking to you? Uh, some people. It's more... You know, it's funny, there are authors out there who will claim that they have really good sources inside the CIA, and that's basically a lie. Uh, <laughs> I, I would know, hope it, it is. <laughs> the, the agency does not make a habit of talking to reporters that much, or, or novelists. Um, uh, but, but there are people who I can talk to who might, you know, who might be sort of former, let's say they're former uh, army officers. And so I can ask a question about tactics or something like that and it's not specific to you know what did the what did the United States do you know here at this time it's just in this you know in this tactical position what would you do and so that's the kind of question I can get answered what when you're doing your research um, you're among friends here so so you, you can spill it um, anything come up that really surprised you about the spy business uh, you know, it's what's what's surprising. I think is how much the CIA has changed since 9/11. That it really was I mean, for better and mainly for better. I think somewhat for worse. It was this place in the 90s, especially that was totally at sea, um, and you know they, they didn't have much of a mission, and there was a lot of drinking. Actually, there was a lot of sort of the 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 old CIA certainly you know, in the 80s and the 90s, uh, especially, was a lot of guys going to cocktail parties and trying to recruit, you know, the uh, mid-level, let's say, Ministry of Defense official in whatever country you were in. And you could waste a lot of time doing that. And, and a lot of them did waste a lot of time doing that. Um, and 9-11 and woke people up and really, uh, really forced them to take what they were doing a lot more seriously. But at the same time, it changed, it changed them into almost a paramilitary organization where a lot of the emphasis was on, you know, who are we going to kill this month? Um, you know, what, what terrorists are there out there that we can target with drones? Um, and the drone program was a big part of that. And so on the one hand, they've been very effective at, uh, you know, there's, there has not been another major terrorist attack since 9-11. And when you start talking about the CIA since 9-11, you have to give them a lot of credit for that, um, whatever else you think about what they're doing. On the other hand, they, they're not, they've been less of an espionage agency. And I don't know how they, they're, they're trying to return to that. Obama has definitely made, uh, he's made an effort to say we need to go back to more espionage and less paramilitary, less, you know, kinetic operations, as they like to say. Um, the kinetics being the kinetics of the, you know, bullet or missile that blows up. Um, but how they get back, I don't know. And I think people don't really recognize that. Um, the other, you know, the other thing that I, the realization that I had and what people sort of told me, but this is now public, is just how much the NSA was doing and what their capabilities were. And um, that, was, <laughs> that was a surprise to me, as it was a surprise, I think, to a lot of people uh, last year when the disclosures came out. Speaking of the NSA, you, this is so timely. I mean, we've got um, Snowden, Snowden. In, in the book. Yes. Uh, you know, I try to make the books feel very real, and so... Uh, you know, that, that includes, you know, referencing real people, real events. 
one of the, the thing, one of the things about the counterfeit agent is it's about an effort to trick the United States into a war with Iran. And I don't want to say who the bad guys are because that does not come out until late in the book. But they spend a lot of time trying to figure out how to avoid being caught by the, you know, by the, essentially by the NSA, really more than the CIA. They're more worried about communications intercepts than anything else. And um, I mean, there's no question we have by far the most robust electronic spying in the world. Anybody who's read a chapter in one of your books knows that you know your history. I mean, we go back to, and, and you have it in context, you go back to the origins of the, the Taliban and you know, uh, up to present day. It's important for you to get it right. Yes, yes. Uh, and if I don't get it right, I hear from readers. Um, I, I, this book, actually, I've gotten fewer uh, comments about mistakes, which I think, which is a good thing, because I, I know the book's selling pretty well. And so if I haven't heard back, it probably means there are fewer mistakes. Um, the, one of the better mistakes I had of late was in The Night Ranger, which was the previous book. Uh, several readers, and the first reader who pointed this out was Newt Gingrich, um, <laughs> believe it or not. Uh, that famous book reviewer, that famous book Newt reviewer. Gingrich. But, yeah. but Newt, Newt apparently knows all about hyenas. I don't know if I should be surprised by that or not. Um, uh, he, and he's a fan of the books. And he emailed and said, uh, you, know, you, you, you know, I like the book, but there's, a, there's several scenes in The Night Ranger, because it takes place in East Africa and Somalia and Kenya, where John Wells, where the hero, is uh, he's battling, he's up against hyenas. There are these hyenas, and he winds up actually having to shoot several of them. Um, and, you know, hyenas, contrary to their reputation, are not cowardly animals. They're very fierce. They're pack animals. And on occasion, they will fight off lions. Um, and I, I'd actually, I, I'd seen them in the wild and was, you know, sort of very impressed with them and wanted to have them in the book and did a fair amount of research and yet somehow managed to miss the fact that hyenas are not a patriarchal society. They're matriarchal. And it's not an alpha male, as I initially said in The Night Ranger. It's the alpha female. Um, so Newt pointed that out, and several other readers pointed that out. And in the paperback, I corrected it. So, uh, <laughs> so the dirty little secret of the books is if you want to make sure I've got everything right, you should wait for the paperback to come out. <laughs> there is a Newt Gingrich connection to our Palm Beach Zoo, by the way. So maybe... <laughs> is he uh, funding the he, hyena exhibit? He, he and uh, a previous d director wrote, co-wrote a book together. It oh, one yeah. about ecology and, huh. and environmentalism. And so... He's a, Who knows? He's a, I've never met him. I, just based on our email interactions, I, he, he seems like a very smart guy, whatever else he is. Speaking of guys, we have to look at John Wells, who is your main character. Describe him to us, uh, if, if you will. So would. John Wells is the hero of, of all eight of my novels, and he is now a former CIA agent because he, he quit. I won't say he quit in a huff, but he, he eventually got tired of being used and quit, and now he gets used in different ways. Um, but uh, he, at the beginning of The Faithful Spy, which is the first of my novels, which came out in 06, he has, he's being sent back to the United States by Al-Qaeda, and he's been inside Al-Qaeda for several years. Um, as He was sent in by the CIA before 9-11, and 9-11 happened, and he failed to prevent it. And he essentially decided at that point that he was not going to leave Afghanistan and Pakistan until they believed in him enough to use, they know he's American, to use him in another terrorist attack, which he can then prevent. So that's, that's who he is. He's a, he's a CIA operative who's been undercover for a very long time at the beginning of The Faithful Spy. And... And the CIA does not really trust him when he comes home. And by the way, if this sounds like homeland to you, um, as it may, because he's also a convert to Islam, um, and that has also Im that impacts his relationship with the agency. They don't really trust him. Um, you did this before. I did this before Brody homeland. and homeland. That's correct. Uh, Wells Wells existed before Brody, and the fact that Saul Berenson on Homeland is called Saul Berenson is not a coincidence. <laughs> the, the 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 guys who created Homeland. Uh, Actually, they were on, they'd ran they'd ran 24 before they created Homeland, and they had me out uh, to consult on 24. So they 
they're fans of the books. Um, and I try to look at this in a positive way as saying like, oh, you know, they paid a little bit of uh, tribute to me rather than saying, you know what, they stole my idea. <laughs> um, but that's the genesis. That's who John Wells is. He's, a, he's this disaffected but ultimately loyal citizen of the United States, um, loyal American, who, who, although he's a very, he's a soldier as much as a spy, and on some level he has a soldier's attitude, which is these orders may stink and they may even be wrong, but, but my job is to carry them out. Um, and so he winds up, even after he quits the agency, which he does about four books in, he winds up enmeshed with the agency and being used by the agency. And he, 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 he is not, he knows he can't save the world. He knows he's going to be used, but all he can do is try to carry out missions that he thinks are generally going to help the world a little bit. I still want to go back to converting to Islam sure. because everybody does. Sure. The, we have a lot of problems in this country with stereotypes. Sure. It was important to you uh, for, for him to go this religious no, route? No, no. That, that, so that's, I didn't do it because I wanted to make a point or anything like that. I did it because I thought that John Wells would need something because he's, book, The, the Faithful Spy came out in 2006. So he, by my conception, had been over there for six or seven years continuously without ever coming home because he, he realizes that he can't break cover, he can't leave. And so the, he needed something to hold on to. And the only thing for him to hold on to was the religion. He, he's not gonna, you know, he's with a group of people who are Muslim and who are violently anti-American. He's not gonna become violently anti-American. If he's going to bond with them in any way and not go crazy from loneliness, he has to take their religion and, and really believe in it. And he does believe in it. He, Wells is not strongly religious, and that would be true if he were Christian or if he were Jewish. Um, he, you know, he, he does believe in God, but he doesn't believe in, you know, sort of a, a she certainly doesn't believe in a just God after all he's seen. Um, and, so, and so Islam for him is a religion, but it's also this thing to hold on to. And then it becomes something else as well, which is he becomes disaffected with the United States because he, he sees you know, the wealth and sort of the, the, the thoughtlessness sometimes of contemporary American culture, and he doesn't like it. And Islam is a way for him to stand apart from that. So, I, it, you know, it's funny, I, I, I don't know how many, if any of you have read the books, but I feel very fortunate that the books have done as well as they have because I think Wells is actually not that easy a character. And um, as, you know, as, con as characters in contemporary spy fiction go, he's more complicated and I think more difficult to like. I think ultimately people like him because he has real integrity and because he is, he is a really tough guy. <laughs> his girlfriends would agree with you. Yes, his, his girlfriends keep leaving him. Romantically challenged. Romantically challenged, yes. You mentioned 24 uh, a few minutes ago, and you consulted on that. And when that first started, that was like the, the most clever TV show yes. ever. Yes. It was great. Kiefer Sutherland was the agent. How was it working on that? How, was that, uh, was it that was, experience Well, like? it was very interesting for me because when I came on, it was the beginning of the final season. And so they had literally done everything. You know, they had... They had blown up a nuclear weapon not once, but you know twice. I think they'd blown up all of L.A. They, you know, they'd had the super virus. They had they had everything. So they were sort of stuck creatively. And television, the way television is made, is actually very interesting from the, to see from the inside. And you had all these very smart, creative people, and and you know, and quite well paid. And they would sit in a room for hours, batting around these ideas. And some of them were actually quite clever. And then they would just look, and somebody would say, oh, well, we did that, you know, three years ago, or we did that in season one. And, and ultimately, they, I think they sort of gave up creatively, and, and they went back to the basic, you know, tropes of, the, of, of every year's story, which was, which was, 
Kiefer gets called in by a buddy who's in trouble. And that was yeah. sort of how season eight started, and that's how that all the seasons started. It, and I'll be very interested to know, and I've not been part of it, but they, they're, they're coming back, right. uh, I believe in June um, this year, uh, what they're going to do. And I don't... I, 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 Howard Gordon, who's the creator of 24, is a very talented guy, and I don't think he would have agreed to do this. He does not need the money if he didn't think he had a really good idea. So I'd love to know what it is. As right. they say, stay tuned. Exactly. In the beginning of the book, here is John Wells on a Caribbean cruise, and I'm going, this can't possibly be. I mean, it's all just too nice. With his girlfriend, he's ready to propose. He gets the he's, ring with he's him. Got the he, ring. He's ready to propose, yeah. and then, of course, something happens, and you know if you've read any of the other books, you're on your way to an adventure at that point. Yes. Now, if I was your wife, I would think the next adventure should be like Bora Bora. Yes, I think I'm beginning to think that because too. then you could do research well, there I, and I, take I, the family. I mean, I you know I've been to Lebanon, I've been to Saudi Arabia, I've been to Afghanistan for these books, I've been to you know Egypt. Uh, I, you know, so, uh, I was in Iraq for the paper, and uh, yeah, John's got to go to like Paris. And, I you know, think so. I'm sure you all know who Dan Silva is, and Silva <laughs> has like four places his heroes go. You know, it's like Zurich, London, Rome. Occasionally, he sends them to Moscow. But that's I got to get Wells on the European. Although tour. Istanbul is a fabulous place. Yes, Istanbul is is nice. And your sense of place is as much a character. In, in your books, you uh, really yes, nail it. I try, I try hard to, to do that. Because um, so, I feel like it's something people buy the books for and you know, not, not everybody's gonna get to go to these places. They're expensive and they take time to get to. And you know, if I can get you there and you, you know, you're excited to go, then that's a, that's, that's a good reason to buy the book. You can, when you read it, we know you've been there. Uh, it, it, it's obvious. So, you know, if this doesn't work out, maybe travel writing could, could be next. <laughs> um, I, if, I think it's gotten really hard to make a living as a travel writer. <laughs> I would love to try it. There's a guy named, known named Stuart Stevens who um, actually ran the Romney campaign. Uh, but Stuart is a like, genuinely interesting and weird guy. And he wrote these great books about uh, China. This was like pre in the 80s when China was really close to Westerners. And... Africa driving from, uh, you know, from us, I think from like Nigeria up to the, to, no, to the North African coast. If you ever have a chance, look up Stuart Stevens for some good travel writing. Oh, Stuart Stevens. We looked at briefly Snowden, the NSA, the nuclear threat. There's one thing, and, and I wondered how much is based in reality, and you've pretty much answered that eh, it, this is pretty real stuff, which is scarier than if you made it up. But there's parts in the book where they are throwing around money, like $100,000 for information or misinformation or a hint of, sure. of a name of someone. Sure. Does that happen? Well, you know, we have a $700 billion defense budget and another 60 or $70 billion on intelligence. 100000 what's that between friends? Wow. That to me, that that was scary. I mean, there are literally duffel bags, and this is you know, this is uh, this has been reported. Uh, duffel bags of cash get dropped off at Hamid Karzai's office. You know, we've been trying money that may or may not have been well spent, but uh, you know, that's uh, yeah, we spend a lot of money. The book, the counterfeit agent. Our guest, Alex Berenson. Thank you so much for being it was, here. It, it was a pleasure. Delightful. Thank you. And a little something for you uh, from. Uh, a, a Our PBS good, station. Yeah, this is, there this you is go. probably like an Oscar bag. Huh? There, that's like, it. That's it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. There's probably a pledge form inside. So, okay. <laughs> Thank you very Thank much. You.